afternoon. It's Thursday the 12th of November 2015, just after one o'clock. I'm your host, Mike Robinson. Um, and joining me today, I've got two guests. I've got Mark Anderson from American Free Press, and I've got uh, John Devine from Worlds Apart Newsletter. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Right, we're doing very well, thank you. And uh, John, I've got to start with you because uh, it seems you're doing very well. You've got yourself a new uh, prime minister in the last number of days, and he seems to be extremely into diversity and he has uh, decided he's going to have equal number of men and women in his cabinet and he seems like uh, is he the second coming well that's the impression we're getting up here but uh, my previous experience with mr trudeau when he was in opposition uh, he wouldn't even reply to my letters i sent him in regards to our technology on groundwater preservation so we'll see what the future brings but a little communication certainly would go a long way with us well uh, so what, what, is his, uh, what is his background? What, where is politics and so on? His father was a liberal. He's a liberal, of course, and uh, they were heavily involved in politics from back in the 60s. His father, I think, was three terms of prime minister and so on like that. And then Justin's come along to, uh, he bumped out the conservatives who were in power for about 10 years, and now he's the new guy in the block. Time's going to tell us to where we're going to go with that one. I mean, he's only 43 years old. What does a 43-year-old know about running a country? Well, that's the question, you know. There's always in our society that everybody looks at the, the intelligentsia, looks at how many degrees you've got and this and that and the other thing. But I like to look at how wise people are. And I always ask the question, uh, young, can young, a young person like Trudeau have the wisdom to, to start into his, his leadership, uh, let alone uh, the ability to make the right decisions? Um, so, sorry, you were saying that his, he comes from a political dynasty, really? I mean, is, is this the equivalent of the Clinton family? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. They're the, they're the, the left of the, of the political realm up here and, uh, you know, it flips itself back and forth. The other side up here would be the, the Harper government, who you can compare with the Bushes and the Republicans. Now, now the, the Clinton-type Trudeaus are, are back in power again. and. Uh, so, but he's, uh, he's, he's telling the world that he's going to pull out of Iraq and, and that type of stuff. And he's uh, quite concerned about global warming and himself and all the premiers of Ontario are all headed to Paris to, for the global warming conference. So we'll see. And what's his position going to be on this global warming conference? Is he going to uh, sign you up to, to uh, massive uh, cuts in terms of uh, industrial output? Well, yeah, we, we're into this business of uh, uh, being taxed and whatnot for uh, penalties of not reducing our emissions and so on like that. The part that really concerns me is how do you quantitate uh, the success of what you, you are, you've done to clean up the air? It, uh, you know, like we have volcanoes going off all the time on the planet and everything else. And I don't know how science wrote the formula as to where we're really at, but it's pretty handy sometimes to raise revenues just by saying this is all for global warming. Uh, and, and interestingly, in our story, you can quantitate how much water is left in the aquifers. It's, it's an actual measurement. You, look, you measure the well and the water is there or not there anymore. So our story is a little easier to, uh, to bring to the public in regards to um, what, what water is left. And of course, that takes you where to mark is that out in the Midwest in the Ogallala Aquifer. And the experts are saying it uh, at one time was the size of nine and one half Lake Erie's and now it's half of that. And they're, they're suggesting that it will be empty in another 30, 40 years. And of course, that connects us over to the banking community because Moody's has indicated that credit ratings will now be determined by the availability of water. And of course, it takes me back to my original slogan, how low will the wells go before the banker says no? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me, indeed. Uh, Mark, have you any comments on the... On the uh situation in Canada with uh, with a new prime minister and where that might take us? Uh, nothing real in depth at this point. It's pretty fresh, but you guys are correct in saying it's a lot, a lot, it's a lot like the left-right whipsaw we get here in the States. We get the conservative Bushes like the Harpers and we get the liberal uh, Clintons and, and that's much like the Trudeau dynasty. Um, what I'm seeing from the young Trudeau so far isn't real encouraging. Um, Certainly, he wants to be part of the global community, which is really kind of a mythological construct uh, anyway. And so it's too early to make a lot of broad judgments, but um, so far I don't like what I see, but I'll keep an open mind and we'll see how it goes. 
Well, thanks for that, Mark. OK, well, let's uh, move along, because uh, one of the things you wanted to discuss, uh, John, was was the uh, the pipeline, the Keystone pipeline. Um, give us a bit of background to this story. Well, our story takes you into NAFTA and uh, the little business where we started our $2.8 million venture into uh, advancing technology to reduce the consumption of groundwater to raise a pound of farm fish. And uh, we were operating a business and selling products from the states went all, all under the umbrella of NAFTA. Uh, the guy who enacted legislation up here that destroyed the little business was Jim Flaherty, who at that time occupied the position of the Ontario Attorney General. Then he went on to, into the federal government and he was Canada's finance minister and he was heavily involved in the whole X-Line, XL pipeline project. And I'm trying to tell everybody that there's uh, the violations of NAFTA put upon our little business uh, directly connects with the XL pipeline. Number one is discriminatory practices that uh, uh, the, the federal government of Canada will put up billions of dollars in supporting the project, which now, of course, has just been announced it's all on hold because of the declining price of oil. But more importantly, it takes you back to the old Galala because everybody's worried about the pipelines going over top of the old Galala. And if we have a spill, uh, that very well could be the end of the old Galala. Um, so, so what was this pipeline then? It was, it was transporting oil, was it? That's right. They're tapped into the tar sands out in Alberta, and it's extremely, extremely expensive oil uh, to to process and then then move in the uh, uh, in the pipelines. Uh, you know, and that takes you back to the governor of Bank of England, who said people investing in this type of oil might not be getting their returns because the oil prices have fallen, and shortly thereafter. Um, they stopped, uh, the project is put on hold and probably has to do with the, the falling price of oil. Uh, so, you know, it all kind of interconnects and of course the environmentalists, everybody's got to be concerned about the business of expensive oil, risking that to put it over top of the Ogallala or this insane fracking that's going on around the country. At the other end of the spectrum, you had uh, Flaherty in his belligerent attitude towards a, a factory farmer who was trying to reduce the consumption of water and uh, wouldn't compensate for damages on the property. Now, it's a, a, a fairly complicated story, but it needn't be if we were to get replies back from the government. But more importantly, whether it be Great Britain or anywhere in the world, it's, pe it's time that people understood that governments are into farming and specifically factory farming. And, yeah. and, that, and that, that, that speaks to how they always serve the big interests and not the little ones. That, you know, that, you know, not the small water developer or fish farmer like you were, but, you know, they were willing to shepherd along TransCanada. Um, it definitely speaks to that. Interestingly enough, uh, after we did one of our broadcasts with Mark, uh, uh, Mr. Flaherty uh, resigned his position, and, uh, you know, the conflict he was in was obvious, but nobody's talking about it up here. The bigger problem we have in Canada is our media outlets, and that takes you into the story about not being telling the stories about the little guys and justice has put upon them and always kind of guarding the big guys like XL Pipeline. Uh, one, of the, one of the media outlets I have a real problem with is Bell Canada Enterprises, whom we're shareholders of, and uh, their refusal to explain to the, to the public about this uh, factory farming that the governments do and a little private sector moving in to help the government's factory farming, not being fish farming, and BCE saying nothing about it. Now, when the story does get out into the masses, uh, you know, the image of BCE has got to be tarnished and there's got to be some uh, concerns of shareholder value falling. But that's just one snapshot of, of our media outlets in Canada. Like, it, it, we, the people are just not being informed. And what a greater, what a better example you can have than the, than the business of not understanding, not explaining to people that governments are in the factory farming business. As I said in my edition, probably one of the original factory farms was fish farming, growing a large number of animals in a confined space. And, uh, you know, if the people aren't educated about that, they, they just don't connect the dots. And, you know, take you back to the Ogallala, the same out there with their farming community. The beef farmers, poultry farmers, everybody else is concerned about the water consumption, but nobody has thought about their brethren, the farmer, that being Governor Ricketts. And, you know, how many gallons of water are you using? How many gallons can you save by using our proven closed system and so it, it's a it's a real curmudgeon here in regards to uh, media not telling the people thus the people don't know takes you over to the whole banking story in Canada that's another one that 90 percent of the people don't know and it's because of the media again well we might come on to that in a second but of course uh, it's not just farming that's uh, making use of water because uh, uh, Nestle is is a big 
uh, consumer of water, or should we say, do they steal water, John? Is that what goes on? Well, th this is it. They're in here bottling in our aquifers, and they, they, uh, they are now drawing out of the Guelph aquifer. And CBC did a story recently about Nestle's wanting to get into another aquifer in the same region. The, and the story was, was told, but the problem is CBC did not say how much revenues the citizens of Ontario are receiving for the water that's being extracted from the Guelph aquifer. And that boil, that is $3.71 per million liters. Now, you know... So, so sorry, say that again? $3.71 per million liters of so, water. So this article here says that they are going to take uh, 1.6 million liters of water per day. So what you're telling me is they are paying the local community three, basically $3 a day for that. That's what's happened in the Guelph Aquifer, and we, we ascertained that information from the people who are protesting about uh, the Guelph Aquifer, which they're currently drawing off of, and uh, we have no idea whether they're drawing it down or what. But it's just preposterous to think our grandchildren are going to be saying, well, what are you doing selling water for $3.71 a million liters, and you turn around and you see the massive profits that Nestle is reaping from that, you know? It, 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 it's just incredible. But we don't know because our media won't tell us. Yeah, but uh, I mean, Nestle Nestle's an ice company. They're giving sixty thousand dollars worth of bottled water to uh, to to homeless people. So that must be that must be a huge dent in the profits, no? <laughs> I don't. know. The profits have got to be gargantuous. The thing that you're paying three dollars and that seventy some cents per million liters. I mean, that would just be a drop in the, literally a drop in the bucket if you want to go there with that statement. How much is how much is a bottle of water, a liter bottle of water in in Canada, John? On average, I would say a dollar twenty-five, a dollar fifty for just a small bottle that you you buy at the dispensers. So I mean, the profits that they must be making from this are obscene. Well, you know, because the cost of extracting the water out of the ground it can't be that much because if you're drawing out of the real, real clean water, number one, you don't have to worry about treating the water very much. And number two, it's just the fact of drilling down into it, like sticking a straw in the ground and sucking it out. Like, I mean, the, the, the overhead expenses of this cannot be that much, you know. And, of course, the government gets a little bit of tax money at the sales end of it, but uh, there's, there has to be some serious profits made. And, again, that takes you back to NAFTA. Uh, I, I'm suspicious that they're in here under the umbrella of NAFTA, and yet Little Fisherman's Cove, where the $2.8 million venture to started to preserve water, some of which Nestle will be using, uh, you know, we were under NAFTA, buying and selling American products, boats and motors and all that stuff for the recreational fishermen, and we just got totally run over, and no compensation to demolish and rebuild on the land taken. Mark, what's, uh, what's Nestle up to in, in the States, and, and particularly... Is how much how much of the Californian problems are as a result of uh, Nestle's activities? Well, California's problems are mainly linked to drought as of late. Um, you know, it, the water issue is kind of complex. You break it down. You don't get enough rain, then you have to irrigate more. But irrigation comes from underwater, you know, underwater underground water. Excuse me. And then the aquifers get hammered that much harder from irrigation because of the lack of rainfall. And that happens in the Midwest, too, with the Ogallala underneath Nebraska and about seven other states. And then you kind of look at the big picture. You come over to Michigan, you have Nestle facilities right in Michigan that I have seen close up. And the water extraction plant in um, kind of west central Michigan that I saw was one of the biggest buildings I've ever seen uh, of any kind of building and huge pumps and uh a widespread operation to suck the groundwater um, underneath uh, Michigan, which of course is the home of the Great Lakes, the largest store of fresh water in the entire world overall. And so you have a extreme mismanagement going on. Municipalities, too many of them in America, still fluoridate the water. Fluoride has been shown to be very harmful to human health. So our municipal water that is piped into our homes and businesses is tainted by government policy and chlorine to clean up pathogens also has a downside. And so then we're left with bottled water to drink that is supposedly more healthy than municipal water. But then we have the monopolies like Nestle providing this bottled water after our municipal water that comes into our homes is tainted. And so we're kind of forced to drink the bottled water um, that is such a high profit range for, for uh, the Bilderberg-connected Nestle plant. 
at Nestle Corporation, rather, which is based in Switzerland, but has you know this big operation in Mich Michigan. So you have this kind of interconnected network that um, is hammering our aquifers really hard for profit, and what's left in our municipal water is is largely tainted by actions of our own governments, uh, again, through fluoridation and whatnot. So water mismanagement is widespread and multifaceted. John, what, what is the impact of uh, fracking in uh, Canada at the moment? Is, is, is there much water uh, disappearing from aquifers to be used in that industry? Well, there is, is one of the bigger problems, as Mark alluded to, in, in the Great Lakes Basin here, it's really, really difficult to get the citizens to understand the lack of water in the world because we just have so much water up here. And thus, it's a lot easier to exploit because everywhere you're, you're standing on massive aquifers, you're surrounded by the Great Lakes, 65% of, of which the whole Great Lakes Basin contains all of the planet's fresh waters. So we're up against it to educate the people to start with just because we know no different. There's just endless amounts of water. But what is concerning is when you get outside the Great Lakes Basin, or for that matter, if there's any oil reserves that they need to frack, in the Great Lakes Basin, uh, you know, you get blowing stuff up in the ground and whatnot, and you, you just don't know where the oil's going to end up. And uh, it, now all of a sudden the price of oil's fallen, and I, sus I suspect that the fracking will be for naught, other than the damage is done to our groundwater. Uh, so in, in Canada, the fracking activity is mainly for oil as opposed to gas, is that right? Yeah, it, as I said about that one out there in British Columbia, they, they let a charge off out there, and it was the largest man-made earthquake. Uh, and all in the pursuit of oil, like it's just a little bit of insane behavior to say the least. Uh, yeah, indeed. Mark, any comments? Well, what John just said um, is well taken. Uh, the overall addiction to crude oil, of course, is the fundamental problem. The idea that the energy and money monopolies and the political system of the world basically tells us, look, we'll give you all sorts of different models of automobiles, and these automobiles will have all these features, but they will primarily run on gasoline, a product of crude oil. So we're, we're kept in the crude oil straitjacket, and then it's just a matter of where you get the oil. Is it going to be the tar sands of Alberta through the now delayed Keystone XL pipeline, or will it be offshore drilling platforms? But it's got to be oil, we're told. You know, Clara Ford, Henry Ford's wife, had an all-electric car in the year 1914. We are simply being kept on an artificial oil addiction that results in fracking, which also contaminates groundwater, just like the flow through fish farms contaminate groundwater uh, because all the waste of the fish and the chemicals are not cleaned out properly, and it's just water in, water out, and the effluent is just dumped in our rivers and streams. And the con contaminated water from fracking is improperly disposed of in most instances, too. So we have this um, large volume uh, usage of groundwater where the, ground, the contaminated parts are not properly cleaned up. But in the closed loop recycling fish farm models, like John has uh, investigated, you know, this takes care of the problem. So it's, it boils down to a constant lack of solutions in this world where we don't have enough development on alternative energy to get off the oil addiction, and we're not using available technologies to properly manage our groundwater, our freshwater. Uh, and the, the big monopolies, the big money men, the banksters and whatnot keep us on this treadmill so we can't break out and adopt new technologies and solve our problem. Uh, well, indeed, um, and of course, um, the, these, these technologies are being actively withheld. It's not that we're not investing in them, we're not in investigating them. Um, many of them already exist. There are already p patents available and, and we're not being, they're not being allowed to, to progress. I'll take you back to a story up here in the CBC last week. They did a story about a conflict between girls and a soccer team and a fish farm. The fish farmer was uh, supplying money to sponsor the soccer team, but the girls in the soccer team started protesting about the environmental footprint of the fish farm. CBC did the story, but I'm saying, why wouldn't CBC do our story about technology that will dramatically reduce the footprint of the fish farm and re reduce the conflict between the kids and the fish farm? But CBC only paints the one side of the story and the rest is covered up. Well, indeed, John, that's right. And, and I mean, your, your story is quite similar to, to uh, a gentleman called Trevor Jackson that we covered um, a couple of years ago on this program, who had developed a, a fuel cell uh, based on uh, aluminium. 
uh, and uh, constantly absolutely blocked by the government and the various uh, uh, committees and departments that, that are designed that are geared up to look at uh, alternative energy sources uh, and uh, really it, it is incredible how, how governments are prepared to, to, to put roadblocks up against uh, new technologies where it doesn't seem to fit with vested interests agenda. Well, and, and one other thing up here in the, in the private sector, the corporate media, which owns the rest of them, we have Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, then we have Bell Canada Enterprises, for example, and all their print media under the, um, under the big conglomerate of BCE, all the print media is in financial trouble. And I say there's a serious conflict because the only thing that's keeping all those guys afloat is the amount of money that all the provinces are paying the, me the print media to advertise lottery tickets. Like every time you turn around up here, they're advertising 649 tickets in every province and whatnot. And, the, and yet the media won't present a story saying, hey, look, it, let's call time out here. We don't need to advertise a monopoly. And instead of s sending all that money out to the media, let's hold it and see we might have more money at the end of the season than we do now. And maybe less people gambling money rather than putting it into a healthy situation of the economy. But Bell Canada, they, they went one step farther, back to the farming community. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the, the OLG, the Lottery and Gaming in Ontario, decided that they're going to cut the prize money to the horsemen, the standard bred race horsemen. And anyways, they were the original provider of gambling money to the government. That, they're not making it quick enough and fast enough now, so they're going to get rid of the horsemen under the, the farming community. And yet, BCE, all of a sudden, six months later, gets an online gambling license from the OLG to replace the horsemen. Huh, well, unbelievable. well, John, I mean, you're in a good position nonetheless, because I understand you have a you have a, a minister for innovation. So surely these new technology, surely new technology should be getting a promotion from uh, from from the uh, Canadian government. No. Well, we we've, we've lobbied to them. Uh, my son, Mark, has, has written to them and, and told them what we have and whatnot. And they just nobody replies to us. We like we, we spent over 20,000 hours trying to tell everybody about this recycling technology. And uh, the, the last visit we had from any authority in the government was the Ontario Provincial Police. And they came knocking on our door, and when I opened the door, I told them, now you have to remember here, I am an editor of a newsletter, and we are involved in an ongoing police investigation involving Ontario Lottery and Gaming. They proceeded to walk in, sit down in our house, and threaten us if we write, wrote any more letters to government officials about it. So as well as not answering our letters, we all of a sudden get the police knocking on our door. And uh, that's all detailed more in one of our broadcasts. But uh, I'm saying, like, that's a fundamental right of free speech and free press. And the CBC knows all about it and refuses to do anything about it. Well, maybe, maybe this article in the Global Mail gives a, gives a clue about, uh, about the thinking of these people, because this, is a, this article is entitled Four Ways Canada's Innovation Minister Can Spur the Economy. And it says the main exiler in the uh, incoming government promised for Canada's slow economy was infrastructure spending. Smart investments in infrastructure can help long-term growth, but the roots of Canada's growth challenges go deeper than poor transit and crumbling bridges. Uh, Navdeep Baines, the incoming Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development, and as I say, that's a really wonderful title, so you would think that really Canada has no problems if you've got somebody with that job title. The incoming Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development will play an essential role in addressing those challenges. There is no magic potion for lacklustre economic performance, but we offer, this is the Global Mail, we offer four things the minister can do to spur the Canadian economy. And I just, <laughs> I just had to include this because the four things are, are really innovative. So here we go. The first, he should make Canada's Competition Bureau a world leading competition enforcement agency. Second, the minister should think should rethink the previous government's regulation of telecommunications and broadcasting. Third, the minister should reform Canada's rules uh, reviewing foreign investments. And fourth, the minister should invest in Statistics Canada. Businesses need sound statistics. Maybe businesses need sound statistics so they know how far the uh, Canadian economy is tanking. But I do not see anything in those four suggestions from the Globe and Mail which could possibly improve uh, or innovate or provide some kind of scientific or economic development. John, um, what, is, what is the problem with the thinking of mainstream media right around the world, not just in Canada? Um, uh, th these, guys, these guys aren't thinking straight, are they? 
<laughs> Absolutely not. And the Global Mail is owned by Bell Canada Enterprises, and that's the, the big guys and whatnot. I reported uh, Bell Canada Enterprises to the Securities Exchange Commission as well as the Ontario Securities Exchange Commission about not giving out enough information before this previous election. And uh, again, as a shareholder, I'm concerned when, when the masses start finding out about the negligence of BCE, especially when we're talking about preserving groundwater and aquifers, you know, you could get a, an effect similar to what went on with Volkswagen in their belligerent attitude towards emissions from their cars. Uh, but, uh, th yeah, th this, this stuff that the Globe Mail writes, it's identical to the CBC and the fish farm conflict with the soccer players. Uh, BC gets on this business of what these guys are going to do, but we're not getting the full picture. We're not getting nearly the facts we should be getting. So, I mean, what is the health of the sort of... Um if we want to use the word alternative media community, because is that the, I mean, if the, if the mainstream uh, media isn't covering issues um, that they should be covering, uh, there must be other sources of information that people are using. Well, the, the, the media that we belong is Mark and whatnot. We're out there doing our best, pounding the bush and whatnot, but we're so fragmented. And I'm not sure where our society's at because more and more people have their faces into text machines, talking to their friends, and less and less people are listening to any of the big picture stuff. And periodically, I think people sit down and look at CDC, Global Mail, which is Bell Canada Enterprises, and justify their knowledge by what they get from there, and that's about it. But the concentration of the individual because of the amount of information that's floating around is, is diminishing rapidly. What, what's your take on this, Mark? Well, Mike, what you read from the Globe and Mail is pretty much what I expected to hear. Competition enforcement sounds like a real oxymoron. Boy, I'd sure like to know more about that. But it sounds like more of the same, where all that matters is growth for the sake of growth, and all that matters is the investor class. The idea of real innovation, of new ways of managing groundwater, such as a, a closed fish farm system like John has developed and studied, or of alternatives to crude oil so we don't get hooked on Keystone XLs anywhere in the world. Uh, all electric cars, which were known over 100 years ago, but never really rolled out all the way. The EV1 by Chevrolet, they tried to roll out, but that was uh, put the, they put the kibosh on that, um, um, oh, some 20, 25, 30 years ago, somewhere in there. At any rate, uh, you know, real innovation, real options, whether it be groundwater, energy, even Tesla, even as something as far reaching as the, the research of Nikola Tesla, all that stuff is sequestered for the most part. Yeah, you can get dual fuel or dual, yeah, dual fuel cars, and you can get, you know, cars that run on E85 ethanol um, and regular gasoline. Sometimes you can get part electric, part gasoline cars. Granted, it's coming along in tiny baby steps, but, you know, this this uh, Globe and Mail article and this Ministry of Innovation is just very unconvincing at this point. Uh, we need real alternatives now. Uh, bear, uh, bear in mind here, too, guys, uh, innovations all comes from intellectual property. And uh, it was the intellectual property that we brought from the University of Guelph and put into our holding system at Fisherman's Cove, where this all started from. In NAFTA, there's a protection clause for, for intellectual property. And we've been violated not once but twice in that. Uh, ironically, we were selling boats supplied to us by manufacturers in the states like Smokercraft to supply the recreational fishermen. But at the same time, we were trying to enhance the, the health of the fishing population at large with our research via our intellectual property. And so where the Global Mail is going with this innovation stuff and whatnot, nothing will be innovated if you don't protect your intellectual property. This spilled over into the roof of the casino after we got wiped out financially, and Penn National comes in and one more time destroys our intellectual property by stealing our audition read of the hands of our readers and suspending my son Mark and myself for a week. So intellectual property on NAFTA, there's no enforcement agency right now, so I don't know where these guys are coming from about innovations. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, John, just to, just to, uh, to finish off here, you um, wrote an... Uh, an article for your own newsletter, which is then published in the Alliance Times Herald, uh, and uh, tell tell us a little about about what you're what you're talking about here. Factory farms help hunters. Yeah, I, I was trying to educate the masses at large that uh, factory farms and the governments are in factory farms and they farm fish, and the fish are raised to fingerling size, where they take them from the government hatcheries and put in our lakes and streams. Those fish are either caught 
by the recreational fishermen and or some move down the streams that are gobbled up by the ocean trawlers. So there's a definite connection between hunters because hunting is defined as gatherers of food. Uh, there's a definition I, I put in the article itself. To educate people that there's a real connection between factory farms and hunters, I think something which the vast majority of the people don't understand. It's a worthwhile read. Your point here is that, that, uh, that obviously the hunting uh, fraternity then is, uh, is supporting the pollution of water. Is, really, is that, is that your main point? My point is I don't think the hunters know that's what's going on here to supply a product to them. The fishermen, the recreational fishermen, the commercial fishermen, the, the, the massive footprint that the government's putting into the environment to supply this to them. I don't think the hunters and, and the, the guys have connected the dots here. If, if they were to find out that the, they were recipients of something that was causing so much waste of groundwater and whatnot, they'd be first on board to say, well, why don't we start retooling all our hatcheries in North America to the closed system? Okay, well, look, um, we're just about out of time. Um, I'd like to thank you both very much for joining me today. We've had our technical issues, but we'll sort those out. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll have you both on again very, very soon. Have you got any closing remarks, Mark? Well, I, just to sum up what John said really briefly, uh, John's providing a very tangible example of the solutions that are there across water and energy and whatnot, just as we as a group uh, provide solutions and alternatives to the mainstream media that covers all this up. So I would point out we're about solutions while the establishment and the establishment media is about vested interests. And so we're on the right track and let's stay there. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much to our audience for joining us today. Uh, we will see you same time tomorrow. Thanks, bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Mike.